Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Authority webinar. Um, uh, my name is Toby Fox, and I'm the Managing Director at FreeFox, the marketing agency for councils. Uh, and I'm here today um, thanks to Montague Evans. Uh, as regular viewers will know, uh, FreeFox's job during the coronavirus crisis has been to keep our network connected across the public and private sectors. And we're doing that through a series of webinars that provide councils with a platform to discuss their ambitions and the challenges they face and their influences and issues of urgency. And today the issue is heritage and how we value it in the rush to recovery. Even in the best of times, arguably, the planning process can give too much weight to economic growth as opposed to heritage. But in this worst of times, as councils push forward recovery programs, is there a danger of consents being granted for the sake of action and progress, which might undervalue heritage assets? Places with heritage are places with culture and identity. They're places where people want to hang out, they want to be. But redundant buildings quickly become eyesores and much of our high street is becoming redundant. So how important is it to use the past as inspiration for the present and the future? And of course, perhaps most fundamentally of all, there's a cost to heritage, both in terms of resourcing the public sector to identify and to protect, and to the private sector in development complexity and consultation. So where does that fit in measures of viability and does the value added outweigh the preservation premium? One of the starting points for any discussion of heritage is the notion that nostalgia for one person is revulsion for another. And I always think of the, the Get Carter car park. Um, this was a brutalist concrete car park in Gateshead in the Northeast, which gained notoriety after featuring in the 1970s movie, Get Carter. Uh, for our younger viewers out there in Zoom land, uh, it's a long time ago, but it's in color. Uh, I'm not that old. Um, Anyhow, despite attempts to preserve it, it wasn't listed and it got knocked down at the beginning of the last decade and turned into Trinity Square Shopping Centre, I think. Um, I loved that movie and I remember at the time of demolition feeling sad, but also feeling sympathetic uh, because I wished that the building could remain, but I was very glad it wasn't in my town centre. So for the next half hour or so, we're going to explore some other examples of buildings that inspire strong feelings and the advantages and challenges of preserving them and the sense of place that they evoke, even as we recognise the urgent need to revive the UK economy through development and growth. And we're going to do that in some excellent company. I'm very pleased to introduce to you in alphabetical order, Tamsin Daniel, who is Heritage Services Manager and Red Roof High Street Action Zone Project Manager at Cornwall Council. Uh, Kate Faulkner Hall, who's Associate for Planning and Development at Montague Evans, and Dominic Holmes, Director of Development on Olympia at U Capital. If we're lucky, we may have a special guest joining us later too, with some information about a forthcoming event. More about that later. Meanwhile, in a variation on our usual format, today our panelists are each going to take you through a short presentation. <coughs> our aim in that uh, is to provide you with a variety of case studies to fire your imaginations and stoke some conversation. We expect and encourage uh, questions from the audience, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to submit and vote for questions, and we can put the most popular ones to our panel in about half an hour. So our first presentation, it's going to take us to the Southwest and the particular heritage issues of Cornwall in the company of Tanzin Daniel. Uh, Tamsin, I'll load up your slides and it's over to you. Thank you very much, Toby, for the introduction. Yes, I'm the Heritage Services Manager for Cornwall Council, but also the Project Director for the new Redruth High Street Heritage Action Zone. And we received our notification of um, success with our application to be one of the few towns in the southwest um, earlier on in the year. And then, of course, we went all into lockdown and we had to rather review our programme and how viable the various schemes were that we were um, suggesting for the programme um, going ahead. So, yes, this is the Redruth High Street House Scheme. It's a share of the £95 million national scheme. There are 10 towns in the southwest, and the only one in Cornwall is Redruth. We landed on Redruth by taking um, a sort of a safari around the 19 major settlements in Cornwall. 
and appraising those against the matrix that set out what historic England were looking for from their heritage high streets and also what we as Cornwall Council wanting to achieve in terms of that uh, revitalization of our town centres where we thought there were opportunities but also um, shovel ready projects. As many of you probably have experienced quite often when the central government comes online they are looking for projects which are sufficiently developed that they are what they'd classify as being sort of shovel ready, ready to go forward, you have gone through public consultation and that there is a general feeling of support for that scheme. So the Redruth High Street has um, is a four and a half million pound project. A significant part of that will come from match funders that includes the private sector. The building that you can see on the screen here is called the London Inn. It's a grade two building. It has been derelict for over 10 years, except for this small charity shop that you see at the front with a rather nasty um, shop front. So this scheme is looking at uh, co-funding coming from the owners who are a development company. And we'll be returning to um, a rather more historic looking shop front, the street level to be sort of four retail units. But then above and behind, we're looking at 11 new good quality apartments. And so that is also bringing residential use back onto the high street in Red Ruth. And this is very much part of what we feel is that revitalization of our town centers. And I think is that direction of travel that many of us are now looking at. We've also got what we're calling the butter market cluster, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of that in a minute. But that is, again, a, a number of buildings around the historic town centre of Red Ruth, which aren't derelict, but they are underused, and partly because of the fabric of the town has fallen into dis disrepair, Businesses don't necessarily want to take them on, but if we can bring in good Wi-Fi, um, those sorts of things, and actually refurbish it and make it look very attractive, we have actually got businesses now on a waiting list to go into those new uh, workspace accommodation. And alongside that, Destination Red Ruth, that is a sort of the heading for a real programme of bringing together on a single website all the fantastic reasons why you'd want to visit a place like Red Ruth, which is at the heart of Cornwall's Mining World Heritage Site. So Red Ruth has been a very important market town for many centuries, but from the 18th and 19th century in particular, it became that financial and administrative centre for hard rock mining in Cornwall, and probably has some of the best historic fabric that you will see in Cornwall in a town centre. We've also got a, a programme of public engagement and we will be bidding for cultural programming as part of this scheme um, next month. The focus of the cultural programming is very much around uh, young people and getting them involved in how they can understand change, the process of change in a place like Red Ruth, and then by understanding change to think about the change that they want to themselves drive and to help create a voice for them. Um, so they are, they are the users, you know, they will be people who are actually bringing that life into the high street. So yes, it's for everyone, but we really want to make sure that young people actually have a voice in creating the high street of tomorrow. So this shows some of the amazing buildings that we have to play with in Red Ruth. But you can probably also see that, you know, we've got Lobelia growing out of one of them and for sale signs up. Um, and, you know, quite a lot of particularly sort of the wooden side of it all look, looking a bit decayed. But there's massive potential, I think, in Red Ruth. And one of the reasons we selected Red Ruth, because we had already put in significant investment in the old brewery site, which is just off the high street, but between the town centre and the school. And so young people were having to walk past this derelict site every day, twice a day, going to and from their homes and from their school. And it added this sense of, well, you know, what's the future for them and what's the future for them in Red Ruth? And so over a number of years, we secured European funding and Cornwall Council funding to do all the flood alleviation work. And then that enabled us to apply to the lottery to then create Crescent Kerno, which as you can see on the left-hand side is what it looks like now, and the middle is what it looks like inside. What you don't see is this massive um, new build on the end of it, which will actually last our archives for the next sort of 50 years of collecting. And this building brings together the world's largest collection, over a million documents, um, books, maps, and photographs, all relating to Cornwall's history. And so alongside the sort of town centre regeneration, we also have this great new research resource. It will be having a changing program of exhibitions and the like. 
This opened up in September last year and was incredibly popular and then has gone into lockdown as many of these sorts of places have. But we are hoping actually the next couple of weeks to start to bring the public back into that building. Luckily, it is a large enough space that we can actually um, bring in a, you know, a reasonable number of people to come back and to be able to use those archives, which is really great. So this is another project which we've done in the next door town called Camborne. So just outside Camborne, you find King Edward Mine. This is a key centre of Cornwall's mining world heritage site. Cornwall Council acquired this um, when the Camborne School of Mines moved off the site. And we acquired it in order to safeguard it for the world heritage site. And we acquired it in the process 19 grade two star buildings, um, a number of which were on the heritage at risk register. So the lower left hand corner you see is sort of an aerial view of the cluster of buildings. Above that, what looks like a very uh, rotten shed, that is a grade two star very rotten shed, uh, kept together by the woodworm holding hands is what we sort of reckoned. That we've actually transformed into a fantastic new destination cafe. So the two pictures to the right of it are sort of the front and the back of the new cafe. Being grade two starred, uh, that original structure is just where the seating is, but we then put on an extension on the back for where we brought in all the kitchen sort of services. And then and down below, in a couple of the other buildings, the Count House and the Carpenter's Shop, we now have nine really brilliant um, workspaces for a variety of businesses, ranging from a yoga studio that brings over 100 clients every week to the site and indeed to the cafe. Um, we have physiotherapy there. We have Cornwall Wildlife trip there, a hat designer and the like. So a really good cluster just outside Camborne of these sort of creative and environmental businesses. Then this is the, my last slide, and this is a project in St Ives. So if you see the top right, all that sort of grey slate um, cluster of buildings. That is what we're calling Portman Studios and the fish cellars. And lower right is the view from the beach looking at those studios. I think what I wanted to emphasize with this slide is that this is about a sort of changing use and a continuity alongside the evolution of use. So this was sort of built in the early 1800s. It was partly as a barrier to stop the sand washing over St. Ives. So it was in effect a wall. And then within the wall, fishermen then created Created their spaces for net settings, you know, repairing their equipment and materials and those sorts of things. And so that was first servicing the pilchard industry. Then when the railways came to St. Ives in the sort of the mid 19th century, and artists started coming to St. Ives as well, of course, the quality of light and all the rest. Um, that was also started to see the decline of the fishing industry. So artists started to take over some of these net lofts and use it as their own studios. And from that, you start getting the St. Ives artist colony. What I think is particularly great about this project is that it has retained the use of the fishermen in those lower cellars as well as having the artists there as well. So we think that this is probably the oldest studio complex in continuous use in Britain. And what was particularly important is any of you who have been to St Ives, this project has safeguarded that for those two communities. So rather than being turned into luxury flats, and you can imagine what those would look like, and I would have that flat if it was on the market and I had the budget. <laughs> <laughs> we have maintained that link between the artists and the place. Otherwise, artists and fishermen get priced out. So other than the um, accommodation we have here for the fishermen, the only other sort of spaces that we have for the fishing industry is up on the industrial estate on the outskirts of St. Ives. So this has retained that connection between those really important parts of St. Ives' distinctive history um, through this investment, which was a combination of a multiple sources of funding from European funding, Arts Council, Heritage Lottery funding, Historic England, Seascape, all sorts of things like that, fisheries funding. It, we brought together probably over a dozen different funders to get this £4.9 million project done. And of course, to the right of it is where you have Tate's and Hives. So again, it's keeping that attraction for the visitors to understand the link between what they're seeing in the Tate and the artist colony and the fishing industry in that conservation area of St. Ives. So I think that's sort of my presentation. I hope you got a flavour of the idea of we're talking about uh, preserving heritage by looking at new uses, continuity of uses, distinctiveness, and making sure that um, 
you know, there's a balance between the impact of the visitor economy and the second homes and the holiday homes, as well as trying to keep an actual sort of foothold of our more traditional industries as well within these um, town centres. Thank you. Fantastic. Tanzin, that was absolutely brilliant. And, and all sorts of themes that, um, that come out of that, not, not just the sort of retaining usage and not, not pricing uh, people out, but also involving young people in, in consultation around heritage, which is just inherently a, an interesting kind of philosophical um, proposition, isn't it? Um, because um, my sense of heritage comes from when I was, well, the things that I was doing when I was young and the places that I was, I was in. Um, the, the idea of repurposing um, buildings and also creating destinations with, um, with a real sense of place, you know, that, that you've already got uh, a, a, a sort of arts di destination there. So, so building on that to, to create and augment the, the sense of place there. Um, brilliant, great, great stuff, good thing to start with. Um, and now for a culture clash, uh, as Dominic whisks us away from uh, rural Southwest and, uh, and to the capital, uh, to London and to one of the iconic sites uh, in the country's capital, Olympia. Uh, Dominic, can you talk us through your approach there? So I'm going to talk about Olympia London, uh, which for those who don't know, is an exhibition centre, um, which occupies about 14 acres of West London. Um, and this is the view as it might hopefully look in the future once we finish building. Um, and I'm going to talk you through um, our sort of experience with heritage uh, and this site, um, which you know, since we bought it in 27, we've been on a journey. So in 2017, we've been on a journey um, understanding the estate, uh, understanding its strengths and weaknesses, and, and which led us to a planning application which I'll talk you through. Um, this image I, I think is brilliant. It's, it's 1886 and the new Olympia Hall has been built and, and it is incredibly ambitious and grand in comparison with you know, the local surrounding area. Um, this, it has it, uh, the main grand hall in the center of the screen and then to the right, you can see the building called Pillar Hall, which was for, um, partying, dancing, celebrating big fairs uh, in the Grand Hall. And then lots of terraced housing um, in and around the area with the post office bank just to the northwest, um, which is now known as Blythe House and, and stores the VNA, British Museum, Science Museum archives. Uh, and now this is an image um, just simply taken from Google Maps of what the estate now looks like. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of morphed into um, 11 acres of built area with, with the odd exception in, in the southwest, which is the what we call G-Gate as a logistics yard. Um, and you can see that actually the, the grandeur of the Grand Hall in the middle, um, it, there's a, it's been covered in lots of barnacles and pipes and wires um, and other add-ons around the front of the building for various reasons over the years, in the last 130 years. Um, then the National Hall, which is the bottom of the screen, the Central Hall, the West Hall, the multi-storey car park in the right hand of the screen. Um, they've all been added on during the 20s, 30s, 40s, and actually the West Hall, where it says Olympia West, is as recently as 2011. And so we realised that, that actually what we had you know, what the estate currently does is it's a fairly impenetrable asset an impenetrable site for anyone um, unless you have a ticket to go into an exhibition it was there is a kilometer all the way around the edge of the site a kilometer perimeter where the only real public access is in the in the very southeast which is a it is a pizza express restaurant Otherwise, without a ticket, you're not coming in. So that was one of the challenges we wanted to address, um, as well as the clutter, um, these various add-ons. And in fact, the next image shows that quite helpfully. Um, this is a view looking from the north to the south. This is the grand hall barrel vault and the, the very grand facade. But you can see it's been absolutely massacred by these various additions over the years, you know, ticketing facilities and functions, there's even a fire escape up to the first floor 
um, and they've carved through some very special old freezes in order to do that. So there's been some fairly um, insensitive additions and, and works undertaken over the years, um, which we saw as another opportunity to strip back and improve and restore to its former glory. Um, and then the third challenge we noticed was this traffic issue. As you can see here, um, it's a very busy road along Olympia Way, which is the access. It's a one-way system south to north or on the west of the site, sorry, on the east of the site. Uh, and we thought that that was a real shame. And would there be an opportunity to find another solution with the logistics? Uh, we, we do have 70,000 vehicle movements a year, which move along Olympia Way and around the back of the site um, in order to service the exhibition. So that was another challenge we, we sought to to address. What you can see in this image is a simplified view of, of what I showed you from the air, um, which sort of highlights the, the additions and the barnacles, as we call them, between the various buildings that we sought to address and remove to improve the site. And then this is you know, just an articulation of what the traffic looks like currently. Um, in order to address that, we've actually now as part of the master plan, we're building a 100,000 square foot um, basement car park and ground floor logistics zone to make the traffic much more um, you know, hand managed in a much better way um, so they're not clogging up the roads. And then by taking the barnacles away and removing the traffic from the Olympia Way side of the site, um, we tried to look at how we could open this up to the public and, and, and allow people to come into this without a ticket and enjoy the, to enjoy the space. But we realised if we did that at ground floor, we would be cutting up you know, huge areas of exhibition. And, and one of the key important points about exhibition is having flow through between various halls. When we have the book fair or the ideal home show or spirit of Christmas or show jumping, there's very much a requirement for the show organizers to want all this space opened up and connected um, in this way. So it wasn't an option just to create or recreate the streets that used to exist between the Grand Hall and the rest of the buildings. And so uh, we came up with the idea um, of actually bringing the, the, the new street up above the exhibition areas. So above ground, above first floor, up to second floor level. Um, how this, new platform is is 14 meters up um, but it does mean that we can create a new public realm at rooftop level um, and continue to run the exhibitions in a connected fashion underneath this is a view of what that curry looks like between the grand hall roof on the right and the national hall roof on the left and actually this is the width of regent street between those two roofs the width of regent street so if we can create a new platform that sits above these pipes and wires and vents and ducts, um, then that creates a fantastic new space. And so in diagrammatic form, we move um, up a new platform, which we call the Sky Garden between the two halls. Um, and then we can create some food and beverage units to each side. So we'll hope people enjoy it and linger and enjoy the space between the halls um, with some cover for wet weather and then the, the exhibition business will continue to operate um, as they currently do below in fact in a, in, a, in a better connected way and so very briefly if I just run you through what the master plan now includes um, Olympia Way which was was once full of traffic will now be pedestrianized and all the traffic will go into our new logistics center in the central hall and g-gate theater um, we'll also create some very um, some fa fa fairly small and narrow retail and office units alongside the railway, which runs to the east of this site. So actually there's a nice street feeling along there. And by stripping away all these barnacles and additions in front of the Grand Hall in particular, restoring it to its former glory and um, enabling people to spend time to dwell, to sit there and enjoy the space. They can also go up the escalators and admire the roofs of the Grand National Halls. And from there they can access a new live music venue, a new theatre, also the office building um, where we're bringing some office to the site, as well as access to the two hotels, uh, the cinema and other new restaurants we're bringing to it. 
that's a slightly, um, I suppose, glitzier view of what it looks like than the last image. Um, and you can see now in the blue, these are the office buildings, which were the most controversial part of the planning application. Um, certainly needed for us to be able to invest in you know, digging down the logistics center. And we recognize that this brought harm to the heritage assets, um, but actually crucially involving historic England in the process uh, was, was fantastic. And they were, you know, whilst they acknowledged there was harm done to the existing estate, um, they, they actually supported the application because the benefits of being able to appreciate and restore particularly the grand hall facades and enable public access to the site outweighed the harm that we were doing to it. And this is a, a, a CGI of what that Olympia way will look like in the future. We've removed the beige buildings that house the ticket halls. Um, there's now space to sit, dwell, um, chat. There's no traffic going past um, and it's a much more enjoyable space. This is the view of what the Sky Garden will look like between the National Hall roof and the Grand Hall roof. Um, and then a, a sort of a bird's eye view of, of the new estate, I suppose, with, with the Grand Hall on the right, the National on the left, the new hotel on the left, um, and then the new offices in the background. So that's really a skim through, Toby. Um, Great stuff. And uh, hand back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Dominic. That's, that's a fantastic uh, contrast with the previous presentation as well. But, but uh, many of the, these issues are faced by, uh, by any, any um, uh, heritage-orientated uh, uh, scheme. Um, really interesting also the, the element of pragmatism um, in, 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 in taking that work forward and in understanding what, uh, how to protect and also um, uh, continue to grow. Um, a, a fascinating project. Thank you very much. Now, Kate... You, uh, you, you were tasked with finding amongst your dozens of clients and, and, uh, and schemes that uh, Montague Evans are working on uh, with one that would uh, interest, interest our viewers today. So what have you come up with? It's a bit of a blend, actually, Toby. Um, morning, everyone. I'm Kate from Montague Evans, um, heritage consultant, heritage and planning consultant, uh, so architectural historian uh, by training and uh, and also a planner. Uh, tend to specialise on working uh, on development and designation in the historic environment. Um, it was actually our team that helped Dominic uh, and his colleagues get consent at the Olympia site. Uh, and we are also doing some work in Cornwall, so there are some nice overlaps, <laughs> I think, here. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. Is everyone all right? Yeah. So I'll just move on to my, my first slide. Um, I thought I'd take the opportunity maybe to summarize I think the key issues that are coming out of um, the discussion so far. Um, so the historic environment, what role can it have in the road to recovery? I think it's quite clear we're talking about conservation, not preservation. And by that, I mean managing change uh, to the historic environment, identifying what's important, what makes places special, um, preserving that and then identifying maybe where there's flexibility to replace quite frankly what's less special to get more floor space or to adapt the building to a new use. I think we've got to see the historic environment as adaptable. Um, these new uses have to be relevant. I think both Townsend and Dominic have made really important points about who uses these buildings, who travels to them, um, who do you want coming to the area that's new and doesn't know the site at, at the moment, um, who's going to invest in these sorts of places. Um, investing in the local and his historic environment also reinforces the, the identity that should be invested in. That's what makes places special and that's, um, that's what encourages people to travel to them. Um, I wanted also, we haven't really spoken about it yet, but I'm sure it will come out in the question and answer session, um, the changes, potential changes brought about by the planning white paper. Uh, I think myself and colleagues and perhaps uh, Tamsin and Dominic, you might agree that the rhetoric thus far in the white paper is that the current protection regime uh, probably won't change much. I think the historic environment along with the natural environment is a key focus. Um, the government wants to wants to protect it and is very clear about that. I think it will be interesting 
and important to see guidance from the government on um, how his should be protected in areas of growth and renewal. You know, the government are talking about identifying quite uh, broad brush areas, whether you're, it's going to be a growth renewal or protection area. But what if you have a listed building in an area of growth? What takes precedent? Um, and I think it'd be interesting to see what's what's coming out of the government in the next few months and also the consultation responses on, on that point. So just um, drawing on, on the themes here, we've got conservation, we've got adaption to new uses, got to be relevant to local community, um, reinforcing identity and encouraging investment. Uh, the case study I wanted to touch on is actually a Cornish one. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't all uh, always do work in London. We, we do work throughout the country. We've got quite a few projects on in Bristol and the Southwest and Bobman Jail is probably uh, one of our flagship projects at the moment in the southwest of England, Tamsin, I'm sure you know it, and listeners may well do as well. There's um, currently a museum and attraction centre in the jail at the moment. Uh, its operation is paused because of the development that's currently going on. Really interesting site, really complex to plan for and, and to build. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow on the screen here, but this is the jail site seen from seen from above um, just about when our client got involved with the site um, our client being the development partners uh, for Bob and Jail who operate the attraction as it is at the moment. Um, built in the late 1700s, fairly significant piece of infrastructure located to the northwest of Bobman Town Centre. The large part of the building has been vacant for 30, 40 years. You can see the trees going out the top, obviously no roof um, on a large part of the building. It's all protected by a grade two listing. Um, even the fabric that's falling down is protected by a grade two listing, um, which adds complexity to the planning and, and construction process. Other issues include roosting bats, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, um, and fairly large issues with subsidence and structural complications. Um, everyone loves a historic photograph, thought I'd just show you the complex in its heyday, if you can describe the jail as having a heyday in the late 19th century. Um, full arrangement of buildings, a hospital wing to the front of the site here, I don't know if you can really see my, my arrow pointing, um, which has now been demolished as part of the redevelopment programme. Um, but the civil and naval wings have their roofs. You can see um, the Plenum Tower advertising um, the jail in, in all its glory to the northwest of the town. The next photograph, I think, is probably my favourite. It's one from the early 20th century showing um, the, the interior to the jail. Unsurprising, very plain architecture, very austere environment created by um, the lack of detail, the rhythm of the cells and uh, the walkways consistent across three levels. It's exactly this um, arrangement of cells and um, the, the austerity, of, as I've mentioned, which creates the character of the building. And it's exactly that which is protected by the listing. Uh, so how does one go about converting something like this and making it usable and relevant to not only the local community, but also those who might be traveling to the jail to go to the attraction um, and, and to see Cornwall and to use the Camel Trail, which is located directly to the south of the site. You need vision. I think it's quite clear the photograph on the left um, is the state of the site. Now it's actually quite cleaned up. Um, <laughs> there was a lot more buddlier and a lot more falling masonry when um, our clients got involved. Um, you need a clear vision. Uh, what do you actually want to bring to the site? Um, you need support from the council. You need to be really open about that vision and also be realistic about what you're going to put back into these buildings. As I said, the fabric is, is protected, e even in this ruinous state, um, these buildings are at risk. They, they do need a new use and investment, um, but that, that comes with time and cost when you're dealing with a building like this, as I'm sure many of you listening, listening will know. Photograph on the right is current um, construction. You can see that um, working with architects, 12 architects who uh, supplied these images, thanks very much. Um, construction is currently underway. The, um, the redevelopment is for a hotel. 
two of the major wings are going to be converted to hotel use and the museum attraction expanded throughout the rest of the building, bringing it into the underbelly of the wings so that more people can experience more of the building. And that was a really key part of um, our conversations with council, the planners and the conservation specialists about how to get these new uses in and who can benefit from um, experiencing these new uses in the listed building. A couple of visuals here show the overall intention and the end intention. You can see it's quite a plain atmosphere, but that's on purpose. You know, we, we wanted to try and celebrate um, the original stonework. Obviously we have a new roof, um, but you can see the tower through, through this, uh, the glazing and the new roof, the walkways are reinstated to give access to hotel rooms. Turns out a hotel is quite a good um, use for a prison. You need, uh, you need rooms, you need scale, uh, you need bathrooms adjacent to your room. Um, and so we're able to maintain that, that rhythm, which gives it its character and, um, and special interest. And just a final slide there shows, shows the entrance to the hotel um, from the courtyard on the site. Um, and these uh, and the new, the new services we needed to put in to enable and to enable access, um, inclusive access to the buildings. So there are obviously lifts now and converting it for modern requirements. I think the jail is, if, along with maybe some of the projects that Tamsin has been, been highlighting today, I think um, it's an important example of how uh, investment in local heritage can really help to reinforce an identity point. Um, I think it will hopefully encourage also wider investment in this region of Cornwall. I'm sure listeners will have comments on that. Um, but I see that as important even now, given people are going to be looking at staycations, maybe looking a little bit more locally to spend their money, um, going on holiday to the southwest <laughs> where it's good weather, um, as opposed to maybe getting a, a flight to Spain and maybe they'll find themselves in, in Bodmin Jail. So there we go. Hopefully that sparks a bit more debate from everyone. Fantastic, Kate. Thank you very much indeed uh, for, for that. And we'll, we'll try and overlook the uh, similarities between hotels and prisons for the sake of uh, your <laughs> operator, who no doubt will be playing those down. But obviously, I mean, the, the, the kind of historic heritage nature of that particular prison does make it an attractive place to visit. You can, you can quite see the sort of romance that would, would uh, attach around, around that. Um, now, we've got some questions coming in uh, already from viewers. Keep them coming, viewers. Uh, we will get to them very shortly. I'm going to kick off um, the questioning, though, because um, in in thinking about this session um, uh, while we were while we were drawing it together, um, I, I thought m maybe one of the opening questions really ought to be around the our, our our opening statement, which you know is is there actually a rush to recovery? Are are we noticing in the market that? Um, that, that, that uh, growth is being prioritised? Is there a sense that, that heritage um, might be being overlooked? And, and, and that sort of relates into, you know, we, we have a, an anonymous attendee is questioning us and that's always a slightly ominous sign. But, but the, the, the question is, how can we explain that heritage is important to residents that might otherwise be more concerned with job losses and access to healthcare and other seemingly more pertinent uh, and of the moment issues? Um, so, so are, are we noticing a change? Uh, Tamsin, have you noticed a, a change down in, in, in Cornwall? I suppose in a way what COVID has done is it's actually exacerbated what we were seeing as a more slow decline in the town centre and the high street. The changes that we were all noticing and probably contributing our, ourselves in terms of out of town shopping centres, online shopping and things like that. And actually what businesses survive on the high street. And I think we were seeing that as a gradual shift and a gradual decline in footfall and spend on the high street. And then of course with COVID and those shops sort of going into lockdown, but I think what I found was really interesting is that some of the places like the cafes and the restaurants then actually had to reimagine themselves and start doing some sort of home deliveries and start doing just think about their business rather differently than relying on people actually coming into their shop. We had various sort of cafes and things who created a hatch where their doors were and they were serving their coffees and their cakes and all that sort of stuff, benefiting from the good weather. It'd been very different if we had the lockdown originally in the winter. I think that would have been um, incredibly tough. But I think what we've seen is actually in some respects COVID has actually really shoved us into uh, rethinking our high streets and but the benefits or the things which the, the few positives we saw with COVID was 
reduction in car travel, some of those streets actually opening up to being pedestrian. And I think certainly Cornwall Council, we made some of the town centres pedestrian. So Truro went pedestrian in the town centre. And some areas had a little bit already. Penzance is going pedestrian in a couple of weeks time on the main sort of shopping street. So that sense of actually people taking back their high street as a place that they want to spend time for it to be a safe environment to be there with their family and the like. So I think COVID has made the rapid change in how we think about it and actually possibly has made some of the big things we wanted to do potentially more acceptable because people are starting to experience that already as a byproduct of COVID. Great stuff, Tamsin. Thank you very much. Um, Kate, Kate, just turning to you, I mean, is that something that resonates with, with other clients of yours in other, in other places across the country? Yes, I think so. I think um, the rush is certainly in the rhetoric, isn't it, Toby, from the government? Um, we've obviously had the white paper draft um, and it's build, build, build. Um, but I think, I do feel at the moment we've, we're in a bit of an eye of the storm. You know, I'm not sure we've really seen the true impacts that's coming to the economy. Perhaps, um, as Thompson said, retail's had its own difficulties um, and, it, and is struggling through them. Um, but I think may not know the true impact until perhaps after the end of October, the end of the government's scheme. And I know the government's pumping money into, into the system elsewhere to try and help um, rebalance that. But I think, um, just going back to the local point, I think people are beginning to think more creatively about the assets in their local area. I think even yesterday I was speaking to colleagues about um, an old BHS store in Banbury that's been repurposed actually by a bunch of um, farmers and local producers who are using it as a, as a food market now. And so I wonder if the rush, yes, there'll be a rush. I think there'll be a rush of um, probably investment from from top down from government but also maybe from local groups actually people coming together and using their businesses in in different ways a bit like Tamsin, Tamsin was just describing great stuff Kate thanks very much Dominic uh, is that is, is that um do you get a sense of a, a, of a sort of urgency to proceed or, or is there much more of a sense of of caution and uh and and um perhaps an extension of your your plans for Olympia um over time and, and pushing the schedule back um, and, and also, I guess, has COVID-19 actually affected the plans themselves, especially for the Sky Garden, the, the fantastic facilities that, that you showed us? Yeah, um, all very important considerations. In our view, broad, broader market is that there was a, a, a lot of investment sitting, waiting, ready to go pre-COVID as a result of Brexit. Um, and we, our view was that people would start to to invest heavily in the UK, both UK and 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 from overseas, once Brexit was settled, and that's been set back again with COVID. Um, that said, people are transacting and they're moving forward with with things that look good. And and you know, I can only really speak about London at the moment, but it's um, there's it's still a relatively positive vibe, even though there's been a, a, a fundamental shift in the way people are working at the moment. Um, our view and the view of most of our advisors is that it is going to be temporary. And even if it's not a temporary social distancing solution, I think people have realized that it is important to, to, to get to the office as much as you can within your organization. Um, it's a fundamental social and professional um, development requirement really um, you know, and obviously the government have been pushing that hard in the last few days. In terms of the way we're looking at Olympia, um, that, you know, we have live entertainment spaces. They are obviously um, significantly impacted at the moment. And the various lawyers involved have been having fun writing brand new COVID clauses about what happens in the future. Um, but otherwise, we're not changing our plans. We still aim to have um, 4,000 capacity music venue. We still aim to have the restaurants and, and it's more restaurants and bars rather than true retail for us, although there will be true retail. Um, but there's no change of plan on that and, and our investors are, are still keen to proceed with that. Um, so, so fingers crossed, that's good. In terms of our, our view on planning, um, it's relatively, you know, I think it's too soon to see any rush. There's certainly... Uh, not a rush, I would say, in the Hammersmith and Fulham local authority. Um, they're still taking their time, and there was a there was a 
quite a long time to adjust to COVID actually and moving to online committee meetings. We're actually up on an online committee meeting on Tuesday for a section 73 for the Olympia application. Um, and I think that's been thoroughly considered. It's been, there's been no corners cut as such, um, even though the local authority are well known to be looking for um, money as part of 106 payments, et cetera, to, to help them in this really difficult time. Um, so as far as we've seen, it, it's been business as usual from planning perspective. Um, maybe that will change. And, and frankly, the, the, there's no harm if it can be streamlined. Um, as far as I can tell, as long as it can be done in a sensitive way, in heritage sense, as long as historic England are, are involved as they should be on grade two and, and above list of buildings or grade two star and above. Um, so I, I think that would be positive if it could be streamlined. And in fact, the local residents around us are always getting a bit frustrated by the perceived time it takes to get through planning and get going on site. We're now on site, which is great. Um, but I think actually the, the general, let's say the layman's perspective on life in planning is uh, you know, frustrated with the time it can take to get onto site. A different world to, to the more professional view, which knows it can take 18 months to get a big application through. Um, it's a, yeah. is, is there a, Dominic, is there, a, is there is it an art or a science in sort of balancing um, the cost and value of heritage assets in, in redevelopment, in, in development? Because I, you know, you look at Olympia and you can see from your images how attractive a proposition that would be to anyone living nearby or anyone who's ever visited uh, Olympia. It's a fantastic uh, scheme that you're, you're presenting. Um, but, but is there a sort of algorithm that you use to say, yes, in this instance, uh, heritage is going to be a plus, whereas in another instance, it's going to be a minus? I wish there was an algorithm. That would be <laughs> tremendous if there was a, a spreadsheet to help us do that. Um, no, I think, I think it, it's very uh, much site by site, um, building by building, um, you know, opportunities, valuable aspects uh, and so on. Uh, it's, um, you know, for us, it was very important to restore the heritage, but there was, you know, we did need to find some additional value in order to pay for putting trucks below ground. You know, that, that's not cheap. Um, so we've had to look at it on the whole and what, what we can get out of Olympia and, and other buildings. But I do think it's, it's very much a building by building approach. I do think people will, um, will pay more, um, not necessarily in a commercial world of office and retail but certainly residential if you can sensitively um, restore and redevelop a historic building then then absolutely we see that adds value and it, it will depend on the type of asset and the type of location as to how much value that will add and therefore you can afford to spend a bit more on restoring facades and and and, and windows and how you go about the double glazing situation and improving insulation sensitively um, so that's the, the residential side of things. It's probably slightly different commercially, I would have thought. Tamsin, um, feel free to pick up on, on, on that theme and anything Dominic said, but also um, one of the things that, that Dominic mentioned was, was Hammersmith and Fulham Council's uh, desire for, for additional funding streams and, and, and revenue streams. And, and, and that sort of uh, highlights another aspect of this uh, for me. What, what's, your, what's your view on the resourcing that councils have to kind of identify and, 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 and protect assets and, and support the, work, the sort of work that you've been doing going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think the resourcing has been under pressure for many years. And we as a local authority, I think, benefited from becoming a unitary council um, a little over 10 years back but from district councils into a unitary. And so we brought together, you know, ourselves as a single sort of planning authority, brought together conservation officers. I run a strategic heritage, historic environment sort of service. I think, um, I mean, future questions will be about the white paper for planning. But I suppose one of our worries with that is it seems to be on my sort of first read of it, that it's relying on the community doing a lot of the zoning. Um, and that actually sort of suggests that all that knowledge and information is there and accessible to communities. And just picking up on what you were saying before, actually, Dominic, about sort of grade two and grade two style buildings being protected. The problem is we have an awful lot of undesignated heritage and a number of places just haven't had that sufficient amount of attention to see actually what is of heritage significance. And I suppose the other part is if you look at sort of, and what's good in the white paper is it does talk about conservation areas. 
and that also would include World Heritage Site like we have in Cornwall, it includes AOMBs and those sorts of things. Within the conservation area, you will have buildings which won't be listed, but they will still be part of that distinctive quality of the place. That thing where people don't actually do recognise as being um, you know, attractive, uh, part of what that place actually means. And so it would also be part of what makes you know, one town, one village different from the next door one. And I suppose one of the worries is, because we do recognise there's a lot of undesignated heritage, um, that actually this zoning, you were sort of saying, what happens if there's a grade two, grade two building within, say, a development zone? Well, actually, more the case, what happens when you've got historic well, buildings and structures of historic significance, which haven't been designated in any way, but are still highly valued by the community? And so from my perspective, we're talking about resourcing local authorities. I have a very, very small team. And for us to engage with all of now the sort of neighbourhood development plans and zoning and to know that if you don't get it right, you could at speed get developers coming in and producing, you know, creating new housing, whatever it is. Yes, we need the housing. But I suppose my worry is we don't necessarily yet have all the intelligence to really put things into those correct zones, identify where perhaps more research needs to be taken, particularly, say, for hidden archaeology. And I think there's a little bit of an assumption in the white paper that communities will as it were, front, have to be front-loading all of that work before a developer actually comes on board. Whereas at the moment, a developer actually is paying quite often for that research, for that archaeology to be looked into and investigated before then it goes to planning. So I yeah. suppose that is about, you know, who, who's actually doing the upfront work? And at the moment, it's mainly developers, and I think it's being put onto communities, and do communities actually have the capacity, the resource to do that? Great stuff. We've got lots in play now, uh, Kate. We've got the, the white paper, we've got the resourcing of councils, the uh, understanding of local communities, and the balance of, of cost and value uh, with uh, heritage assets in, in viability. Um, so feel free to pick up on any of those. And also, I just want to introduce something that from uh, viewer Malcolm Cowan, who's asking uh, how much of a problem is a sort of changing appreciation of particular architectural styles. Uh, so mm. 50 years ago, nobody cared about Victoriana, uh, for example. Mm. So how do you stop buildings being lost, which later would be loved without preserving everything? And I see we're just being joined by our special guest, Heather Cheeseborough. And perhaps mm. this is a, a question of enormous relevance in a place like, like Croydon, um, where, where perhaps there are uh, architectural assets uh, that aren't particularly valued now, but in 50 years time might become of enormous importance to, to people who grew up with them. So um, Kate, Kate, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I think Croydon's quite a good um, example, actually, isn't it? Uh, is it the 50p building? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that um, created a huge amount of uh, interest because many people think it's ugly, but it's actually now very much protected, I think, as part of the town centre region. Correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, but I think, you've, yeah, you've raised uh, points that are brought up in white paper. I've been talking to colleagues about, um, I think this is idea of beauty and what to protect um, is, is quite difficult to pin down. We've obviously had um, a resurgence of interest in brutalist styles or postmodern styles, historic England, routinely go through assessments of these, um, these architectural styles, which many of which, the best building of which are now protected. Uh, through listing. Um, I think just going back to Tamsin's point about resourcing and the involvement of local communities and how the council is perhaps seen as having to um, herald all of this. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know how realistic that is, quite frankly. I think at the moment, um, you know, you get uh, Dominic and his colleagues coming to perhaps myself and my team to do that assessment with the help of people from the community who might know the area better than we do quite frankly but um i'm not sure the councils do really have that resource and and um to go through that process for each and every site and to identify the zoning in, in um in the way that it needs to be done so question you know i think that might form the basis of something we reply with um on the white paper consultation um but I think going back to the point about um, how do we understand heritage and, heritage and beauty in these different phases and I mean it means something different to, to everyone right and people will value it in different ways. Um, I think it's just important uh, about defining it and helping local authorities to define it in written form um, and then 
it's for others to interpret and if they want to alter it through development then um you know they present their case in the normal way and i imagine that's how things will go even if we do get a new legislative regime um i think heritage assets will still be um front and foremost protected but could I pick stuff. up on that, that idea of beauty, though? Because I think one of my concerns is, for example, Cornwall's Mining World Heritage Site, that's not about beautiful buildings. I mean, some of them are incredibly iconic, like engine houses, but an awful lot of those are, are not. And the problem with the focus on beauty in the white paper is it leads me to worry about a gentrification, which also begins to create ghettos for where people can actually afford houses so for example in Cornwall we have one of the lowest average incomes you know in Britain and yet we have also the highest house prices I think you already begin to see the worry of where do people who live and work here in the lower areas lower um, paid areas of our economy where are they able to live and if you uh, look at beauty all the time the beauty then is where the tourists come where you have second homeowners where you have the holiday cottages and you start to ghettoize the people who actually are resident populations here in Cornwall so again this focus on beauty in terms of new development is it going to be a gentrification a um you know and that will also I think be quite exclusive potentially as well. I mean, one, the wonders about historic places is they evolve over time and there's a mixture of people, a mixture of uses. It's not all, you know, one type of person, one type of pay, you know, that that person that that, that community is bringing in. So that is one of my worries is that where's the diversity in that? Where's the affordability? And with developers now not needing to um, create affordable housing with up to 50 homes, you just, you, you worry that you do packages of 50 homes and 50 homes and the affordable housing isn't part of that complex then. Thank you very much indeed, Tamsin. Now, Heather, um, as uh, Director of Planning and Strategic Transport at Croydon, I know from uh, our sessions last week that you've got a few things to say about this, uh, this white paper. Um, feel free if you've got anything to add on, on the aspects of heritage in particular, uh, bearing in mind your official position uh, as uh, Director of Planning and Strategic Transport at Croydon. But also, I think you've got some, some news for us about a forthcoming event. Um, thanks, Toby. Yes. Um... I like the way you warn me about my official position in the white paper because um, you know I have quite strong views on the white paper and um, it's what I see as major shortcomings and I think it's really interesting what Tamsin had to say about beauty and about Cornwall and its particular landscape and this sort of, I'm sorry, it's facile to talk about beauty. Beauty is something we do want, of course, but it's so subjective and actually we shouldn't be trying to be seeking to get beauty all the time because there are other things that you 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 want um in terms of history and and identity and place it's not all about beauty it's too simplistic so don't want to get in there and heritage i don't think is really really covered whatsoever in the white paper really um you know when you have statements at the front by the prime minister saying let's tear up the planning system i it just leaves me cold because i think the planning system whilst it's not perfect, it has delivered and protected so much of our um, heritage and our built, built environment um, since 1947. And I think there's a huge danger that we will lose um, a lot of what is really valuable to us in this country through the white paper. And it, it's, it's just careless and breathtaking in the way it just rides roughshod over all the fantastic work that's been done to date by lots and lots of different, different disciplines to safeguard our heritage and our built environment. So, um, that said, <laughs> that said, yes, um, we we'll talk about um, our site match exciting event next week, which is um, very much about Croydon, my favourite subject if it's not planning. Um, site match 365 um, will be, um, there'll be myself, Director of Planning uh, and Strategic Transport at um, Croydon. There will be um, Councillor Paul Scott, who is the Cabinet Member for Planning and Regeneration, and my colleague um, Stephen Tate, who's Director of Regeneration. And um, we will be there to um, talk about, about our ambition and challenges in Croydon in terms of regeneration. We've got five very exciting development opportunities we want to share with developers and investors and talk about our ambition for Croydon um, and also uh, our challenges and, um, and also to hear back 
um, well, to, to set out um, what we're expecting developers and inward investors to, to do and bring in terms of Croydon. And then we're going to have um, some one-to-one -one meetings that we're going to set up for developers and investors to meet some key staff in the borough to talk about opportunities and how we can work together to bring those development opportunities forward. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Heather. That's all happening at, uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday, and you can find out more and register for that at www.sitematch365.com. Um, and I think that is going to be where we leave it today because we have, uh, we have used up our hour um, with this brilliant conversation about uh, heritage and the, the rush to recovery. Um, and we now have to let our viewers get away and put some of what they've learned from you all uh, today into action. Um, I think my favorite remark, the, the, the piece that I'm taking away from this, this whole project really is something that Tamsin, you actually said a couple of weeks ago when we were, when we were bringing this together. Um, you used the phrase, heritage is most at risk when it has no purpose. And I thought that was that was absolutely right. That's that's really telling. So viewers, uh, your job now is to get out there uh, and create some purpose. Um, while you're doing that, uh, please join me also in saying a big thank you to our panel today. Thank you to Tamsin Daniel of Cornwall, Cornwall Council, uh, to Dominic Holmes of U Capital and to Kate Faulkner Hall of Montague Evans, our sponsor today without whose generosity this session wouldn't have been possible. Thank you all for presenting uh, what are actually beautiful schemes. No one can deny them, uh, despite uh, the, the difficulty we're going to have with using that phrase in, uh, in, in planning regulation going forward. Uh, and thanks, of course, um, to you out there, our curious and questioning and challenging audience for contributing to the discussion. Um, it's a discussion that will continue. Your unanswered questions are going to be tackled by our panel via email, uh, and they very kindly agreed to do that, and we'll uh, circulate their responses through our social channels. There's just time to urge you to join us again next Thursday at 11am when we'll be back with the final part of our briefing on Hertfordshire, uh, a case study of how a county and boroughs and districts and a LEP are all collaborating together to support development and delivery. You can book a place for that and you can watch the recording of this and all our previous sessions at www.thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. Until then, from our panel, uh, from me and from everyone at 3Fox, good morning. <laughs>